Welcome to the Auto Success Executive Spotlight. I'm your host, Brian Ankney. Today, my guest, Shane Bourne from Promax. Welcome, Shane. Thanks, Brian. Pleasure to be here. Where'd you come in from today? I came in from Iowa. Iowa. Yes. Nice. Very similar weather to Akron. Very similar. Very similar. Um, both popular vacation destinations. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to I kind of get started. You and I have a little bit of a unique history. I do. Uh, we have known each other for about 20 years. Um, we met at a trade show that Auto Success was doing at the Venetian, mm -hmm. and you had you were at your booth, and we have both had the exact same job. Well, the same company, not the same job, same company <laughs> ever since. Yeah. It's hard to believe it's been 20 years. I mean, two decades. Uh, it doesn't feel like we're that old, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, in, in, our, in our industry, as much as people move around, what's, what really inspired you to, to, to stay with Promax? Um. You know, I like the way you phrase that question, Brian, because I think that anything that you do for a sustained period of time, especially if it's something that's not always easy, mm -hmm. uh, you have to find your inspiration. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's good people. Uh, good, genuine, quality, honest people. Don't necessarily need to be wildly successful or even incredibly talented. That stuff can be, you know, developed, but just be good humans. And uh, throughout my career, I've been blessed with being surrounded with a lot of those people, you know, not just at the team at Promax, but a lot of our dealership partners, a lot of really good business women and men that are earning a hard working, mm -hmm. honest living, and a lot of vendors uh, that we, we have partnerships with in the industry of good people. And when you surround yourself with, with good people, I think it just inspires you to be your best, best version of yourself. And when you can do that, then I think every day when you show up, um, you can feel fulfilled with what you're doing. And I think that that's a key ingredient to doing something for a long period of time. You know, when you talk about the people, that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, like the relationships that you have at work are, are so important to make the day better. I mean, the, like the jokes that you say in passing and just all, all the little things, like the people that walk by and 100 people say hi to you when they walk by in the morning. Like it, it definitely perks up your mood. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, of course, for guys that are football fans, you, we all get to poke fun at each other. Yes, we every do. Every Monday. I've been getting a lot of fun poked at me. Yeah, I'm sorry about your Bengals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about, uh, you know, kind of the next generation. Um, you know, it, it seems like it's even becoming more and more prevalent for people to move around from job mm -hmm. to job. For, for a young person that is looking for a, uh, you know, a long-term home that wants to find a place like you and I have been blessed enough to work in, um, you know, what advice do you have for them? And is this the industry for them? Well, automotive, absolutely. I think it's the best industry in the world. Mm -hmm. um, not just because of the size of the opportunity. I mean, it's a huge industry. 3% of the GDP directly employs almost 2 million people. And when you think about companies like ours, because let's face it, without automotive, there's no Promax. Yeah. And auto success is just success. And I think that's already taken. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. When you consider the, those industries that are dependent on automotive, it's 7 million people. Um, but opportunity aside, automotive industry provides a valuable service and has for 130 years. People need transportation. And you know, to be part of an industry that provides a genuine value, I think, is, is, is always a good way to go. Um, when I think about advice, I'll share some advice that I heard recently actually at a Cardone 10X conference. Have you mm -hmm. ever been to one of those? I have not. I would recommend it. A stellar lineup of people to learn from. And Mike Rowe was on the stage, the Dirty Jobs guy. Yeah, yeah. And he said that his advice to young Americans is not to pursue your passion, but instead pursue opportunity and bring your passion with you. Find an opportunity that you can discipline yourself to be great at, Mm -hmm. And then find passion in executing on that opportunity and being successful. And I think that's that's great advice. Yeah, that is good advice. I, I want to I want to stick around with this twenty year twenty year history just for a minute. Okay. Um, you know, twenty years ago, well, around that time, I wrote my first article for Auto Success Magazine, and it was called E Leads. You know, like, <laughs> boy, have the, like, things have really changed. Um, you know, over the last 20 years, what are the things that, that, that really stand out to you that have changed in, in the car space? 
Uh, certainly has been a lot of a lot of change in automotive, but just out of curiosity, was that about e-leads the company or just electronic leads in general? It was actually electronic leads. Okay. Like, we okay. didn't even call them internet leads yet. They <laughs> yes. weren't even internet leads because it was like the mix between emails and leads. Yeah. Like it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I remember when that was starting to become more and more popular and uh, we were actually, we would built this ping post system to de dealers could actually bid on leads and mm -hmm. they were expensive. And having conversations with dealers about being strategic and having a playbook on how to convert those leads. And that was kind of something new that was out then. But when I think of some of the biggest changes, I would mm -hmm. say transparency um, from pricing, financing, options, reviews. There's a lot more data available to consumers now before they go to the dealership, mm -hmm. which I think is, is important because it establishes trust. Uh, on the flip side of that coin, there's a lot more data on consumers that's being leveraged by OEMs and lenders and dealers and technology partners to try to tailor messaging and stuff uh, to make the shopping experience better for consumers. Um, regulatory scrutiny, that's certainly increased over the last 20 years. Uh, it was a little bit of the wild, wild west back then, especially in subprime, which you don't see as much of that anymore, which is good. Yeah. Um, AI, I mean, having conversations with a computer and having them listen to your sales calls to make uh, recommendations on, on sales training is something we wouldn't even been talking about 20 years ago. Oh, no. I would say the most positive uh, trend and, and change in automotive over the last 20 years is the influence and the voice that women have in automotive now. Mm -hmm. um, still room for improvement there. When you take into consideration, they influence 85% of the decisions they make 66% of the decisions. They do two thirds of the service trips, and yet they only have 25% of the jobs and 10% of the executive roles, which I think is opportunity because uh, women make phenomenal executives. Uh, you look at Mary Barra, she's lead number one, uh, took it back from Toyota. Uh, my own personal experience, some of the top industry execs I know are women, including uh, one of my direct reports, Melissa, who is actually honored to be one of the Women at the Wheel nominees, which um, is an excellent uh, initiative that you guys do. Yeah, yep. We, we do that every year, and, and it, it gives us the opportunity, our, you know, our editor and our publisher interact with them via video, via written content. I mean, it, there's a lot of content that comes out with that, and a mm -hmm. lot of good content. Yeah, yeah, quality stuff. And, you know, I think women balance men. You know, um, they think differently. They approach problems differently. Um, in my own experience, uh, can tend to be decisive, which isn't always necessarily a bad thing. But sometimes having a logical decision to solve a problem doesn't take into consideration the implications of that decision on other people or other processes. And, and sometimes, you know, if you slow down and you think, well, it's inevitable to have a negative impact on some people because this decision has to be made. Um, but solving from some of the challenges that you're going to introduce with that decision mm -hmm. ahead of time instead of being reactive, um, that can be very beneficial or even more so finding a different solution that can solve the problem without having the implications of the decision and just being a little bit more patient. Um, so I've been very blessed to, to work with a lot of strong women. You know, it's, it's funny, my, my wife and I do a lot of projects together, like a, a lot of projects, and she's always telling me to slow down, slow down. She's <laughs> like, well, you know, what, what are you going to do here? What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of funny, like, you know, the projects turn out so much better. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I, I, I thought I could make some furniture at one point. Turns out I was so wrong. Yes. I couldn't have been more wrong. But yes. with her help, yeah, I can, I can do it. <laughs> yes. Um, some of the, the direct reports I have that of women have saved me from plenty of very logical bad decisions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's 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 stick with this uh, kind of theme of twenty years. Okay, we talked about our personal experience in the last twenty years and the companies we've been with for twenty years, and the car business for the last twenty years. Let's talk about the next twenty years. Okay, what uh, do you see coming? I mean, is it is this going to be a hundred percent EV future? Oh, Brian, the EV question. <laughs> I don't think that there is a more polarizing topic in automotive than EVs. Mm -hmm. I mean. The dichotomy of opinion on the future of EVs is like the Grand Canyon. Uh, if you ask California, 100% adoption in 12 years, yep. right? I think that's a bit optimistic. There are, there are challenges that need to be solved. You know, for yeah. example, the average EV weighs 20 to 30% more. 
which that translates to 1,000 or 2,000 pounds for a car or truck. That increases the chance of a fatality in a crash by 47%. So there is a safety concern there. Um, additionally, technology is just going to have to figure out to make them lighter because range is still an issue. Yeah. Especially in areas that have really hot or really cold weather at various times of the year. And let's face it, that's a big chunk of the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, and another aspect of the range is the infrastructure. Um, we have approximately 130,000 public charging stations. Only 20% of those are rapid. And I read that in order to have widespread adoption, we need 20x that. So wow. there's a lot of work to be done. And I think when you look at the adoption of EV year over year, so 23 over 22, in the top 10 states, they gained about 1% or 2%. In the bottom 10 states, they went backwards 24%. So the infrastructure in those states just isn't there for it to be a practical decision for the average person to buy one. Uh, but 20 years is a long time. You know, there's going to be a lot of technology advancements. Elon Musk, a pretty smart guy. Yeah. Automotive has always been an innovative industry. I mean, heck, 20 years ago, the most popular cell phone was the Nokia because it had a two-inch color screen, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 20 years from now, we could be talking about electronic flying cars and Trying to figure out how to solve the challenge of of turn signals that are up and down and right and left. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I hope I hope that is the future that we see. I, yeah. I would love to live to see a flying car. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I live in New Jersey, and our, our our governor has also said he wants the same the same twelve years. So twenty thirty five, really? we want to be done with internal combustion cars. And you know, I kind of think you know it's it's hard to say that you can just legislate progress. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of like saying, Shane, I'm going to need you to be able to breathe underwater in 12 years. So figure it out. Figure it out. Figure it out. Now, I mean, but I think you're right. I mean, think about what the cell phone did. I mean, I, I totally think that that by changing some of the chemistry in, in the batteries, which is mm -hmm. going to happen, it's, it's going to happen. happen. It'll get lighter. It'll hold more charge. Maybe it'll even charge faster and last mm -hmm. longer. I mean, it, all those things were working on them, right? Right. Right. And so maybe in 20 years, we are all driving flying electric cars. <laughs> maybe we won't even drive them. <laughs> yeah. Well, if we can drive that flying DeLorean, we can come back in time and tell ourselves today that, hey, it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so I, I, I kind of want to stick with the future for a minute. All right. Like, do you see a future where all the cars are, are being sold directly online? And, and where, like, do you see a future without salespeople? So I think that uh, maybe in the very distant future, but I think that dealerships provide, I mean, they're a staple of the community. Yep. They provide a service more than just one transaction. And while the trend of doing more research online, taking more steps to the sale, I think is going to continue, but it's still a significant financial decision. And when you look at the fact that the average payment is north of $700, it's up 32% since COVID, and the other thing to take into consideration is cars are getting a lot more complicated. You know, as we make advances in self-driving and self-parking and instrumentation, some of these cars look like a cockpit getting in. I think more people are going to want to go drive them. You know, what's it like to go from adaptive cruise control to self-driving? What's it like to push a button and have it parallel park? What does this button and this button and this button do? I mean, yeah. I might want to have a face-to-face -face conversation with a salesperson. I might be a little bit old school, but I think the majority of the population is still going to want to drive a complicated, significant financial investment before they actually just buy it like on Amazon. Yep. You know, I mean, it, it makes me think about rental cars. I mean, you, you rent a lot of cars too. How often do you get in a rental car and you're like, you know, you've been driving like 30 minutes. And you're like, oh my gosh, I can't imagine owning this car. I'm, I mean, it's so uncomfortable. You just can't Absolutely. Get the seat right. Absolutely. If, if you just order it online and six months later it shows up, and you just spent sixty grand on it. What are you going to yeah. do? Average ticket price of an EV is sixty grand. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I can't. I, I've never bought a car I didn't drive, or at least drive one like it. Yeah, I've driven one like it. Yeah, like, and and I don't know that I, I don't know if I could because mm -hmm. probably twenty five percent of the rental cars I get into, I'm like, well, I could never have this car. Like, yeah, it's uncomfortable. I mean, we're in automotive, and I've been in a rental car before where it takes me a while to figure out how to fill it up. Like, how do I actually? Pop? <laughs> like, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Or, or, or like some cars don't even have a button to release the trunk anymore, I guess, because of break-ins. So they yeah. eliminated that button and you're just walking around like, where is that button at? How, how do I get, how do I get in the trunk? Indeed. <laughs> well, hey, let's, let's, um, 
let's come back to today. Okay. You know, interest rates are high, lender rejections are, you know, high. What what is going on? What's going on with finance? Uh, so it's certainly been an interesting couple of years along that front. I mean, when you think about 11 rate hikes since March, um, 60 day delinquencies up 26 basis points. It's the highest for subprime since 2006. Oh, wow. You look at rejection rates, the highest that's ever been since they've tracked that data at uh, 14%, which is up from 9% in February. So when you think about that, that's 5% of the people that you sold a car to, you closed them, you can't get them done. You know, that can have a significant impact. And uh, at ProMix, we've been looking at a lot of data over the last couple of months and specifically lender guidelines and callback trends. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's going to be even more important for dealers. And, you know, I've talked to, to my friend Paul over there at Black Book, and they're looking at a lot of the same analytics on the um, uh, valuation side. And so for dealers, when they look at 24, they need to ensure that they are aligning where they're spending their marketing mm -hmm. to bring in the traffic, the traffic that they're bringing in, what does their credit look like? What is their affordability? You know, because the lenders are looking at that. And... What sort of vehicles do you have that the lenders are willing to buy? You need to be in sync in all of those things because if you're at that close to 15% of the people that you're closing, you can't get done, then you either need to examine your lender portfolio, talk to your lenders and see what they're looking to, to finance, type of people driven by your marketing or type of vehicles driven by your acquisition strategy. Maybe expand your lender portfolio and find some of these other uh, lenders out there. I mean, there's 2,000 lenders out there that are willing to do the types of traffic that you're bringing in, the type of vehicles that you're driving, that you're acquiring. Well, you know, that's a, that's a neat point. You know, I hadn't thought of that, that, you know, there, there are, you know, aside from going out and finding other lenders, if you did talk to your lender, I mean, it, it's probably a lot harder to change your customer than it would be to change your inventory. I mean, if you could change right. your inventory to serve your customer better, I mean, I, I can't imagine that the 15% of people that you turn away are really excited to come back to you again. I mean, that's mm -hmm. not, not 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 only is that expensive this month, that's expensive for the next five years. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, if, if you were able to put the right cars there to be able to get those people into cars, you mm -hmm. would be growing your, your customer base. Absolutely. You're giving them a negative experience. Um, some of those are going to go to a dealership that has all facets of their business in line and mm -hmm. they've got the right lender and vehicle for that person. They're going to give them experience. They're probably going to pick up the service. Yep. Wow. Well, let's... I want to shift gears one more time. Okay. <laughs> I, well, maybe, maybe more than one more time. But, but for, for right now, one time, um, you read a lot. So mm -hmm. tell me, what have you read lately that, the, that our audience needs to read? Or, or even give me a couple if you got them. Okay. So uh, I am a bit of a book nerd. Yeah. Um, Brian, I read for two primary reasons, entertainment or refinement and growth. Uh, when it comes to entertainment, I like mysteries, detective stories, maybe a little science fiction. When it comes to refinement, it's uh, you know leadership, communication, sales, mental toughness, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, this year, uh, just this weekend, actually finished a book that our new uh, president of the automotive group, um, Brian Scott, who has been in automotive for quite a while, has a strong track record. He recommended the ELT read a book called The Challenger Sale, which was really good. It's more for B2B, but it's not your typical sales book that's just regurgitating Carnegie, you know? Mm -hmm. um, previous in the year, I would say the two books that I got the most value for would be The Power of Positive Leadership by John Gordon and surprisingly, Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty. Um, I got a lot of value from that. It's, it's probably a book that I'll read again. Hmm. Now, I, I, I got to ask you about The Challenger. I mean, was it was it like selling the idea of of like our space shuttles to, to <laughs> our like to our NASA and government to, to, to build them or like what? Give me a little background on that. OK, so essentially the concept is um, in complex uh, selling where you're more of a consultant. Sometimes you need to challenge the the customer, challenge them to think differently, think through a different perspective so that you can align on a win win. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I'm going to have to check that one out. Yeah, it's and, pretty good. And The Monk, The Monk sounds interesting too. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to check that one out yeah. too. You know, uh, we actually have a book club at Promax. Uh, there's about a dozen of us in it. So it's, you know, I would say for a business, if you want a pretty inexpensive way to um, do some training, a book club's a great way to do. I mean, we spend an hour once a month off site. So leave the work, work an hour early and talk about the last couple chapters that we read. And so we started a new one last week. 
And it's a little outside of what I would typically pick. Yeah. It's called the um, the art uh, or the art of not giving the subtle art of not giving a beep. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> and so my team was challenging me. They're like, "Hey Shane, you can't judge a book by its cover." And I'm like, "But if it has the F word on the cover, maybe you can." Oh. <laughs> but you know, it might surprise me. And if nothing else, it's uh, one more book off the uh, 23 goals. Nice. <laughs> Let's you know that that's 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 a perfect end statement there because I want to talk about goals. Okay, you know, we're getting late in the year and it's almost time to start thinking about goals for next year. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the process that you use to to figure out what you want and and how you you know design a path to get it. Okay, um, first off, I would say that I'm a huge proponent of goals. Um, mm-hmm. I think I think a lot of leaders are. And uh, about 10, 12 years ago, uh, about the time I became an executive, I started taking the last week of the year off. So from Christmas Eve to first business day of the next year, I take that week off. It's kind of nice because I could take that week off and not come back to two weeks worth of work. You know, it's oh, yeah. a little bit quieter. And it gives me a chance to reflect back on the, the year that's concluding and look forward to the year forward. And so what I personally do, and I don't think there's a right or, right or wrong way to do goals. It's just a matter of whether you do them or whether you don't. But me, for me personally, I do categories. And those categories are things that I want to prioritize to improve in my life. So like, you know, spiritual, mental health, um, family, which I consider my core group of uh, friends in that family, health, um, relationships outside of that core, finance, um, competition, which uh, for me is pool. And this year I swapped out a category. There was a category that I had just been abysmal at actually accomplishing that goal for several years in a row. And I took a look at 22 and I decided that I wasn't as happy as I wanted to be. You know, it was a challenging year on a couple fronts. So I created a happiness category. Mm -hmm. And this year, uh, my happiness goal is I thought about things that I like doing and I like going to live music with our best friends. And so my goal is to go to 20 concerts in 2023. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. How far along are you? So we're going to Metallica and Pantera next month. Oh, in St. Louis. man, I'm jealous. Yeah, I'm looking <laughs> forward to that. <laughs> uh, that'll be 18. So actually, I need two more. So if oh. you have any suggestions or any of uh, your viewers have some suggestions, I need two more concerts by the end of the year to, to hit my goal. Well, you should, you, should be able to, you should be able to get there. I think I Tool's going on a, on a tour this fall. Really? I'll yeah. check that out. Yeah, you better check it out. Great. Well, Shane, I... I, I Is there anything else you would like to share with our audience, you know, before we say goodbye today? Um, Well, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you for for inviting me. Um, You know, it's a little bit outside of my comfort zone. I mean, my comfort zone's here and we're currently residing like over here somewhere. (laughs) Um, But I would just say that as as an industry, as we look forward to some of the uncertainties out there, um, the economy, now the strike, um, some of the financial disruption, uh, EVs and OEM initiatives. I would say that businesses that prioritize quality people, processes that are efficient and effective, mm-hmm. and strategies that leverage data and your people, you're going to continue to thrive. I think that's just proven over the years to be a successful way to, you know, take whatever curveballs get thrown at you. Great. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you. This has been fun. It has been. And thank you for taking the time to join us for this Auto Success Executive Spotlight. I'm your host, Brian Ankney. Today, my guest has been Shane Bourne from Promax. We hope to see you again soon. This episode is Over the Curb and Burning Gas.